Cardinal 132, do you have the Cirrus now beaming to your right? Uh, that's negative, I'm looking for. Cardinal 132, he's now behind you to your right. 132, we'll start up. Start our base. Cardinal 132, affirmative. In the future, when I do give you traffic to follow and you don't see him, do not turn base leg because you were cutting him off. Sorry about that. Whoa, I guess he told him. Hey, we're going to talk more about flying at towered airports later in the show. But first, hello, and thank you for joining me here today. Coming up in the news, that Air Canada flight that had a near miss with four fully loaded aircraft on the ground at San Francisco last week, well, it was a lot closer than anyone realized, and we'll talk more about why it may have happened. And ATC privatization is heating up, and it looks like it's headed for a vote soon on the floor of the House of Representatives. Have you contacted your congressman yet? Seriously, have you? And you'll never guess what exemption the airlines got from the FAA. Yes, those rascals that want to privatize ATC and then run it as they see fit. Well, they have an exemption from something the FAA says that you, as a small airplane owner, have to do to your airplane. Plus, we're going to talk about some exciting new avionics introduced earlier this week. Plus, more listener questions in email. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about, you bet, general aviation. I'm Max Truscott. I'm here to help you get smarter, faster as a pilot or student pilot by sharing my over 40 years of experience as a licensed pilot, author, and 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year for the United States. And I'm here to try and bring you relevant news and safety tips to help you fly safely. Now, if you haven't listened to last week's Newsmaker episode, we talked in depth about the Beach Bonanza and the American Bonanza Society, so you might want to check that out. And remember, if you like what you hear on the show here today, please tell your friends. After all, how else are they going to find out about the show? And special thanks to the nine more people who became Patreon supporters in the past week. All this and more, and the news starts now. Well, if you live in the United States and you haven't yet contacted your congressman to tell him or her that you oppose ATC privatization, time is running out fast to do that. Remember, the airlines are mobilizing their customers to contact Congress to support privatization without telling them any of the details of the plan. So we have to counter those tens of thousands of phone calls they're going to be able to generate to Congress. And it's essential that all general aviation pilots contact your congressman this week. Why this week? Because originally the bill was supposed to come up for a vote on the House floor this week, but it's been postponed a week. Now, if we can defeat the bill on the House floor, then ATC privatization is dead for the year, which is awesome. But if that bill passes the House, there's a real possibility that it will get signed into law, depending upon how the House and Senate ultimately decide to resolve the differences between their bills. Now, I'm sure many listeners have already contacted your congressman to tell them you oppose the bill. But for the rest of you that haven't done it, now is the time to act. So if you're driving, make a note that when you get to your destination, you need to take five minutes to go on the Internet and generate letters to your representatives in Congress. It's awfully simple. Just go to G-O-V-T, that's short for government, G-O-V-T dot E-A-A dot org, type in your name, and your zip code. Then review the pre-written letter that says you oppose privatization, make any changes you like to the text of that letter, and send it. Guaranteed, it will take you less time to do it than I've been talking about it on this show. Remember, go to GOVT, short for government, govt.eaa.org. And if you don't take the time to contact Congress now, this week, we may all get stuck with a system that will raise the cost of flying, especially for general aviation. And a couple of quick updates on privatization this week. The Hill.com says that the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, has finished scoring House Bill 2997, which would privatize ATC. And they say it would add $20.7 billion to the federal deficit over the next 10 years. Also, both avweb.com and aeronews.net are reporting that Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger is not a fan of ATC privatization, something he discussed in an interview with Yahoo Global anchor Katie Couric last week. But on the other side of the coin, we've lost a big advocate. In the past, Representative Sam Graves of Missouri has always been a staunch supporter of general aviation and has opposed past attempt to implement user fees. 
But this week, he announced that he supports ATC privatization, mainly because he says he's convinced the House to remove user fees from the bill. Well, that's well and good, but we all know that in the UK, they also promised there would not be user fees, and years later, they added them. So it's sad that we've lost a strong advocate for GA on this particular issue. And here's the kicker to all this. Turns out that the airlines have an exemption from ADSB out requirements. Who would have thought? This is something I discovered while listening to the House hearings on the privatization bill. So I did some research, and what I came up with was an article from AIN Online from October of 2015. And in it, Matt Thurber says, airlines and general aviation owners and operators, so I misspoke on that earlier, it's not just the airlines, uh, they can apply for an exemption to part of ADSB out equipment requirements, which obviously would save them some money. Now, the exemption basically lets them use a less capable GPS, in other words, a non WAS GPS, rather than the WAS compliant uh, GPS required for the rules. So it does require an upgraded transponder, uh, but essentially it allows them to continue using an existing non WAS GPS. Now, this is a rather interesting statement from Rick Perry, Vice President of Government and Industrial. Industrial Affairs for the Aircraft Electronics Association. He said that both Boeing and Airbus are behind the curve on having service bulletins for the airlines to install ADSB, hence the need for a delay. The delay is only for the position source, not the ADSB transponder transmitter. So, yeah, the airlines, these people who are going to uh, rapidly modernize ATC, apparently they can't get ADSB into their airplanes. But we should trust them with running ATC because we're sure they'll do a better job than they're doing with installing ADSB. So remember, if you haven't done it, contact your congressman. We don't want these jokers running air traffic control. Hey, moving along, let's talk about uh, SFO and an update to that near miss of the Air Canada Flight 759 that nearly landed on a taxiway at SFO on top of four fully loaded aircraft that were lined up on the taxiway. Well, this week we found out that near disaster was much closer than we thought it was. Here's what's happened since our news show last week on Tuesday. On Wednesday of last week, I ran calculations estimating that Air Canada 759 had it not gone around, would have touched down on the taxiway in just 14 seconds, or it would have reached the top of one of those airliners within 11 seconds. I posted those calculations on my maxtruscott.com blog, and they were immediately picked up by the Mercury News, which is our San Jose, California newspaper. Now, that's the paper that first broke the story of the Air Canada incident early in the week. And they wrote a story based on my calculations, which was on the top of their website all day Wednesday and was on the first page of the local section of their printed newspaper on Thursday. Later on Thursday, I was interviewed by KPIX, the local CBS affiliate for their 11 p.m. news. And then on Monday of this week, FlightAware.com provided new high-resolution data to the Mercury News that showed that the aircraft was even closer than we thought it was. Those new data show that, that the aircraft was at 106 feet above the ground at the time they were told to go around by ATC. At that time, they had already passed over two aircraft. Now, aircraft number three in front of them was United Airlines 863, and that was a Boeing 787, which is about 55 feet high. So at the time of the go-around, the Air Canada flight was just 51 feet above the height of that aircraft. But because of the inertia of the aircraft and the brief time it took for the jet engines to spool up, the Air Canada flight descended to 81 feet, or just 26 feet above the top of the airliner in front of it, before it was able to achieve a positive rate of climb. And this week on Tuesday, the Mercury News produced a simulation, essentially an animation, that showed exactly where the aircraft was at every point in time, how high it was above each of the aircraft, and that synced with the air traffic control audio. I posted a link to that on my Patreon page earlier in the week, and you can find it by going to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And let's talk briefly why this event may have occurred. We know that runway 28 left was not lit because repairs were being made to the runway. Typically, an aircraft coming into San Francisco is used to seeing two lit runways, 28 left and 28 right. What this pilot apparently saw were the lights of 28 right, the runway he was supposed to land on, nothing to the left of it. And instead, they saw lights on the taxiway from the four aircraft. And those aircraft lights 
apparently led him to believe that that was a lit runway. Now, if it hadn't been for the fact that runway 28 left was closed, the aircraft would never have been on taxiway, Charlie. They would have been over next to 28 left, which is the air, the runway used mostly for departures. So it was an interesting uh, coincidence that aircraft happened to be uh, on a taxi where they really are that led the captain to believe that the taxiway was indeed 28 right. Now, they missed some obvious cues. You know, for example, there was no approach lighting to the taxiway, uh, whereas there was approach lighting to 28 right. Uh, we also know that there was a big red X, a lighted X for uh, runway 28 left, so they missed that as well. And you would think that they would know from uh, their notums that the runway is going to be closed. A, a commercial pilot contacted me earlier this week, and she said that they get all of their notums, their their entire uh, dispatcher briefing package, only about an hour before they leave. And she said it runs typically about 18 pages. She said it's really tough to get through all of that and find every little tiny notum, as well as do all of the other things that they need to do to prepare the aircraft before they leave. So it's possible they weren't aware that 28 left was closed. But having lined up with the taxiway, I think they then suffered from confirmation bias. Now, confirmation bias is when you look at information and you go ahead and trust information that supports what you already believe. So in this case, he believed he was lined up with two-way right. He believed, therefore, the lights that he saw were not airplanes, but that they were runway lights. And you ignore things that don't fit uh, with your perception. So in this case, it was easy to ignore uh, that there was no approach lighting into uh, the taxiway uh, to uh, not see the uh, the large X off to the uh, left side. So I think that once they locked in on landing on the uh, taxiway, their confirmation bias kicked in and they just continued to believe that what they were looking at was indeed the runway. So I think that's a good lesson for all pilots. It's probably the reason that aircraft sometimes land at the wrong airport. Once a pilot spots a an airport, they believe it's the correct airport, and then they start to exclude all the clues that would have told them that no, it isn't the airport. So be aware of confirmation bias when you're flying. And I've just posted one of the television interviews I did about the Air Canada incident. You can find that on the Patreon page at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And that's with NBC Bay Area News. And in other news, this too from the San Francisco Bay Area, from avweb.com, authorities in Sonoma, California, are investigating the deployment of a Cirrus parachute at low level to see whether that was a factor in the death of the pilot. Now, I think this is the first fatal accident that Cirrus has uh, had this year. The pilot was uh, killed, his son, daughter, and uh, their nanny was seriously injured in the crash. Now, that aircraft is based at San Carlos, which is right next to the airport that I teach at. They've been flying in and out of Sonoma Sky Park on Friday. Apparently, shortly after takeoff, witnesses say that the engine quit at a point when the aircraft was perhaps only two or 300 feet above the ground. For reasons unknown, the pilot pulled the parachute handle, and unfortunately, that's below the recommended altitude for deploying the parachute. Uh, typically, I teach that you never pull the parachute below 400 feet, and the reason is that initially when you pull the parachute, the aircraft starts to point almost straight down toward the ground until the line cutters uh, cut the uh, the lines uh, so that it's now suspended correctly from all four attachment points, at which point the aircraft then writes itself to a, a level uh, attitude. So unfortunately, uh, this is one of those situations where the pilot probably should have just chosen to to ride it down. Now, obviously, it's hard to know. We weren't in his shoes, couldn't see exactly what uh, his choices were. But in general, pulling the parachute below 400 feet is a really bad choice. So our, our prayers go out to the family uh, for the loss of uh, this pilot. Well, let's switch gears and talk about some happier news. We have a whole slew of new product announcements. These are always fun. Uh, lots of new technology to take a look at. And I think this is the time of year when most manufacturers time their announcements with Oshkosh, which is why we're seeing so many announcements right now. So first from Flying Magazine, Jeppesen charts have become available as an option for ForeFlight mobile app users. Now, this option is going to let people who use ForeFlight view the Jeppesen departure, arrival, and approach charts within the ForeFlight app. Now, Jeppesen's IFR and route charts are not yet available, but they expect those to be available later in the summer. Now, Jeppesen's worldwide database of charts can be quickly added to the accounts section of ForeFlight app. If you already have a Jeppesen chart subscription, you don't need to pay again to add charts 
to four flight, you simply link the two subscriptions. The Jepson chart option is available with all the levels of four flight subscriptions, which start from the basic plus $99 and run up through performance plus at $299. And also from ForeFlight, they have announced the availability of Scout, just like it sounds, Boy Scout, Girl Scout, a portable dual-band ADSB receiver that delivers in-flight weather and traffic information to the ForeFlight mobile app, and they say it's in the smallest form factor available on the market. And get this, it's just $199. Now, that's a heck of a lot more affordable than the Stratus device, also a portable ADSB receiver that a lot of pilots have used in the past. And as you might guess, there are some differences between the two. Uh, one of which, for example, is that uh, the Stratus device has a built-in GPS, but the Scout doesn't. So I've gone ahead and posted a chart on my Patreon page, and it highlights all the feature differences between these products. And you can view it at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And Garmin has announced some new retrofit autopilots for existing aircraft. You may recall in episode 14, we talked with Joe Geppner at Garmin about the G5 uh, integrated uh, flight instrument. And he mentioned at that time that he expected it would eventually be interfaceable to uh, autopilots that could be retrofitted into aircraft. And it's here. So it's called the GFC 500. It's priced at $69.95 for just under $7,000. And essentially it works in conjunction with the G5 electronic flight instrument. So you would need both of those devices, which would bring the uh, cost of the avionics up to about $10,000 before installation. Carmen says the initial STC for the GFC 500 is expected to be completed on the Cessna 172 in the fourth quarter of this year, and then STCs for the Cessna 182 and the Piper PA-28 models will follow. They've also announced a third-party autopilot interface for the G5, which will provide heading and course data to existing Estec, Century, and Bendix King autopilots. That requires their new GAD-29B adapter. And separately from Garmin, they are introducing a new portable ADS-B and Sirius XM aviation receiver, all combined into one package. These are the GDL-51 and GDL-52, a series of portable receivers capable of receiving ADS-B traffic and weather, as well as Sirius XM aviation weather and audio on portable and mobile devices. The GDL-51 is specifically just for Sirius XM aviation weather and audio, whereas the GDL-52 combines all of those features. Street price is expected to be around $649 for the GDL-51 models and $1,149 for the GDL-52 models. In experimental news, this comes to us from generalaviationnews.com. Kit Fox is introducing a new plane. It's an updated version of their Speedster, which they first introduced in 1992. Now, this 2017 version, they say, is going to feature a clipped wing, and it will be more aerodynamically refined. It's going to have a Rotax fuel-injected engine, and they say it's going to be significantly larger and faster than the earlier Speedster. They say it'll also have a greater useful load and excellent short field performance. Now, the photo of this thing is really beautiful, so I've gone ahead and posted that for you. Just go to the Patreon page, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And finally, from aeronews.net, former Anheuser-Busch CEO August Bush IV was arrested Monday after landing his helicopter at a small office complex in Swansea, Illinois, just east of St. Louis, Missouri. The Swansea police officers were dispatched to report of a helicopter that landed for unknown reasons. Upon their arrival, the helicopter was already on the ground in a parking lot. But after looking around, they thought that the aircraft was a little too close to nearby obstacles. They were concerned about the safety, and so they contacted the FAA, which asked them to forward photographs of the landing. Well, at 8.14, later that night, Swansea police were called again by a caller who had returned to the helicopter and noticed the pilot appeared to be intoxicated and getting ready to take off. When officers arrived, the helicopter rotors were already spinning, but they turned on their emergency lights and were able to get the pilot to stay on the ground. Television station KTVI reports that, according to court records, police believe Bush may have been under the influence of a controlled substance. His wife told officers that he suffers from anxiety issues, but was off his medication due to other treatment for infertility. While searching the helicopter, authorities found several loaded weapons and several containers of prescription drugs. 
Bush was CEO of Anheuser-Busch from 2006 to 2008 when it was purchased by InBev, a multinational brewing company with headquarters in Belgium. Thus far, no charges have been filed. And that's the news for this week. Coming up in a moment, we talk about flying the traffic pattern in a Cessna 172. Plus, listener letters. One listener asks us about the use of flaps during crosswind landings, and another one asks about medical marijuana. Yeah, we'll be right back. And welcome back. Yes, I know I got your attention on the medical marijuana. I'm sure now you're going to stick around for that part of the show. Anyway, before we get to that, over the weekend, I picked up a Cessna 206 in El Paso, Texas, and brought it back along with a new owner here to Northern California. And I'll tell you a little bit about that trip after we talk about uh, traffic patterns. And special thanks to Patreon supporter Bill Millett. Why? He's the first one of you who has sent me some jokes for our special joke show we're planning in August with Rob Mark. So you have the rest of the month, couple more weeks, send me your jokes so I can include them in our special joke show. Go to aviationnewstalk.com slash contact, or just go to aviationnewstalk.com and click the contact button at the top of the screen. We'd love to share your favorite aviation joke. And the new survey is up. What airplane do you fly most? And that's part of the reason I'm talking about the Cessna 172. It turns out a lot of my listeners have flown the 172 more than any other aircraft. So tell us about what plane you fly most and what aircraft you're thinking about checking out in next. And finally, the final question on that survey, what topics would you like to hear about on this show? Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash survey. And this is the part of the show where I talk briefly about a couple of ways you can support the show. First, thank you so very much to the nine new Patreon supporters this week. They include Jason Blair, Matt Bullock, Kevin McDonald, Frank Hardy, George Vasek, Bill Mellett, Charles, Seth Lake, and Don Mack. Thank you so much for your contributions, which have gotten us very close to the first goal of $100 a month to help pay back the more than $1,000 I've spent thus far in equipment and software and web service fees to help launch the show. In fact, we're so close, let's change the goal. Let's see if we can get through goal number two by the end of July as well, which is to raise $200 a month so we can get on to the goal I'm really excited about. I want to create some apps that people can find on Apple and the Google Play Store, and that way it'll make it easier for non-technically or oriented pilots to find us there and listen to the show. There are many different membership levels, starting from just a dollar a month. You can use your credit card to help support the show. And of course, these are the pages you go to to see the post that I mentioned during the show. So if you want to see the picture of that cool speedster, or if you want to see that animation of just how close Air Canada 759 came to uh, hitting other airliners, just go out to the Patreon page. It's at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome because you're awesome listeners. Or just go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on help the show in the upper left-hand corner. Now, here's another way you can help support us, and that is if you use some of the technically sophisticated Garmin GPSs, like the Garmin 430, the Garmin 530, or any of the G1000, I've got courses you can take. If you find sometimes you're stumbling when you push the buttons and it doesn't do exactly what you want, hey, take these online courses. I've got courses for the G1000 VFR, a separate course for IFR operations, and a GPS and WAS course for those of you who are flying GPS approaches using WAS, like LPVs and LNAV plus Vs, using Garmin 430s, 530s, G1000, and so on. The courses cost from $59 to $79, or you can take all of the courses for just a low monthly membership of $29.95 or sign up for an entire year for $2.99. And if you do that, we'll include a half hour consulting call as well. So stick around. We're going to be back in seven seconds. and going to be starting with flying the traffic pattern in a Cessna 172. And welcome back. I was a little inspired to talk about traffic patterns after an aircraft uh, almost cut me out of the pattern earlier this week. You heard that audio earlier. I'll talk more about that. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is most applicable to busy towered airports. So if you have a towered airport where they get one or two landings an hour, yeah, you might not uh, see the necessity to uh, pay attention to all of these details. But it's pretty good stuff to think about uh, for when you do show up at a busy airport. So, for example, I have been cleared to land as number six 
at the Palo Alto airport. Now that's the worst that I remember. Pretty routinely I'm cleared as at number three or number four to land. So things are pretty busy. A certain amount of discipline is required both by the pilots and the controllers to make it all work out. So first things, let's just talk about uh, left traffic patterns and right traffic patterns and why you can end up with both at a towered airport. Now for non-towered airports, there is uh, usually a standard, which is if it's not marked on the chart, it's gonna be left traffic, which means you make a series of left turns to reach the, uh, the runway. And if it is marked on the chart, then it would be right traffic. A lot of people get confused when they go to a towered airport and say, well, why isn't it left or right? Why is it both? My experience has been that usually the tower wants to help you out. And so they will assign you left or right traffic, depending upon which side of the field that you're coming from, so that you can uh, reach the runway without having to cross overhead. So if you're coming from the west and the runway runs north-south, they would uh, assign you to a traffic pattern that's on the west side of the runway. They wouldn't make you cross the field to reach the other side. And at Palo Alto, for example, we have just a single runway, and at times they will be feeding traffic from both the left pattern and the right pattern to the same runway, which makes it particularly tricky because you have to look across the other side of the field at an aircraft on a parallel downwind, which may be about two miles away. That makes it pretty tough. Now, here's an expression which years ago I didn't know exactly what was meant by it. When the tower says that you should make right traffic, I always kind of thought, well, you could sort of enter on the downwind or, you know, whatever you wanted to do. And over time, it became clear to me, no, that's not what it means at all. The phrase make right traffic means fly to a position from which you can enter the traffic pattern on the 45, which basically is a 45 degree angle headed to the middle of the airport. And when you reach that midpoint, about a mile away from the airport, you then turn downwind and fly parallel to the runway runway to uh, complete the uh, traffic pattern. At that point, you should be at the traffic pattern altitude when you're on the 45. And the check ride tolerance on that, by the way, is plus and minus 100 feet, which is why as CFIs, we're always telling our students, uh, hey, you got to be at traffic pattern altitude because we don't want you to, to blow your check ride by being 100 feet off that altitude when you're flying on the downwind. So just to be clear, when they say make right traffic, that doesn't mean enter on the downwind. If they want you to enter on the downwind, they will tell you that, at least at most airports that I've been to. Now let's talk about taking off. Suppose you are taking off and you wanted to make a right crosswind departure, which means you're climbing up to maybe 500 feet or so and making a right turn. Well, if there's somebody entering on the 45, that might put you in conflict with that inbound traffic. So if you are wanting to make a right turn, the tower might extend your upwind. So instead of having you turn right, you know, at 500 feet or whenever you want to turn, they may tell you that they will call your crosswind turn, which means they want you to extend the upwind, continue flying straight out until they tell you to turn, thereby helping you avoid the aircraft who's inbound on the 45 or who's about to turn downwind. Now, let's say you are on the upwind and you are following another aircraft in the pattern that might be slower. You might decide on your own to go ahead and extend your upwind a little bit further just to create a little bit of extra space between yourself and the slower aircraft. You can also sometimes extend your downwind uh, beyond the uh, point where you're, the aircraft in front of you turn to also create a little bit more space between yourself and a slower aircraft. This is really important if you're flying a faster airplane, uh, something perhaps faster than a 172, but even a 172 can get stuck behind a slow Cetabria or a Skycatcher or something that's moving at relatively slowly. So spacing yourself out in the pattern is important because the tower is responsible for sequence. They'll tell you you're number one, you're number two, but you, the pilot, are responsible for the separation, which is the distance between you and the aircraft in front of you. So if you crowd the airplane in front of you and you have to go around, well, it's your fault. You should have noticed that perhaps you had a slower aircraft and create a little bit of space, maybe slow down so that you uh, didn't come up on top of them. So remember, the tower is responsible for sequence. The pilot is responsible for the distance between you and the aircraft in front of you, which is the separation. Now, when I turn to the downwind, I'm typically anywhere between about 0.7 and uh, maybe 1.1 nautical miles away from the runway that I'm flying parallel to. And I know that because I'll usually bring out the GPS, maybe the nearest function, and just see what the distance is as I fly by the airport. And with a Cessna 172, you can often just look out and see where the runway falls on the strut. 
Uh, and that can also help you kind of space yourself at a consistent distance every time you fly a, a downwind. And it helps to fly a downwind, which is about the same distance every time, because that's going to give you a base turn, which is about the same length every time, which helps you with consistency. Typically, I'm going to start my landing sequence after I've flown the downwind the entire length of the runway, and I'm now a beam the numbers of the runway I'm going to be landing on. Unless, of course, my traffic that I'm following is still on final and it hasn't passed me yet. In that case, I'm going to stay level. I'm going to keep the power on. I'm going to maintain my altitude. I'm just going to continue to fly my downwind further until that traffic on final passes my wing or sometimes goes a little bit beyond uh, my wing. Or I might extend my downwind if the tower tells me to do that. For example, they may want me to follow traffic that's coming in on a long straight in approach. And if I start my landing sequence at the normal point, I would be turning in front of that point. So the tower might say that they'll call my base, which means keep flying the downwind until they tell me to turn, which would put me behind the aircraft on that long straight in approach. Or they might tell me to extend my downwind just so they can create a little bit of space between me and the runway so that they can squeeze in one or two departures of aircraft that are waiting to take off before I arrive at the airport. Now, whenever you have to extend your downwind and you're flying a larger pattern as a result, that increases the danger that the aircraft following you might turn early and cut you off in the pattern. And of course, the real danger is not that they might cut you off and get in front of you, but that they might hit you. So anytime you have to extend your downwind, be really cautious and kind of watch, you know, out through the left and the right window and make sure the airplane behind you isn't starting to turn in front of you. And if that happens, immediately tell the tower, yeah, you know, your brief call sign and that the downwind traffic is cutting you out. And the tower should then tell them to return to the downwind. And in fact, uh, anytime I'm a really long final, I expect to be cut out. So I'm always watching the people on downwind to make sure that they fly parallel to me and they don't start to turn in front of me. Uh, but let's talk about the normal case where everything goes right. Let's forget about having to extend the downwind. Normally, if there's nobody in front of me or if the person in front of me is just about to land, as soon as I reach the numbers, if I'm in an older Cessna 172, one built before 1986, a carbureted version, I will have already pulled on the carburetor heat, perhaps about midway down the downwind, a beam the middle of the runway. And as I reach the numbers, I'm going to pull the power back to about 1500 RPM. But if it's a later model, a fuel injected 172 that was built after 1997, then there's no carburetor heat to pull. But when I reach the numbers, is I'm going to pull back to about 1600 RPM. I find those aircraft need just a little bit more power. I'm going to apply some back pressure to the yoke so that I continue to fly level and don't descend. And then I'm going to add 10 degrees of flaps. Now the aircraft is going to be slowing as we fly level. When it reaches 80 knots, I'm going to push forward on the yoke to maintain that 80 knots and then trim the aircraft with a trim wheel so that the aircraft stays at that speed. I'll also check my vertical speed indicator to see that I'm descending about 500 feet per minute. Now, of course, the vertical speed indicator does lag perhaps five or six seconds. So you need to wait that amount of time after you make a pitch change to see if your new descent rate uh, is what you want it to be before you start making uh, further corrections. Most people know that you'll want to turn to the base leg when the start of the runway is at about a 45 degree angle behind you. But they often don't think about how much altitude they should have lost by the time they turn base. And as a result, they can end up high or low. Now, if I'm in an 800 foot traffic pattern, I try and lose about 100 feet of altitude before I turn base. Or I'll try and lose about 200 feet of altitude if I'm in a 1000 foot traffic pattern altitude before I turn base. And if I haven't lost that much altitude before I turn base, I know that most likely I'm gonna be a little high. And so I can immediately compensate by either reducing the power or adding more flaps earlier than I normally would have. After I turn base, I'm gonna increase flaps to 20 degrees, trim again and target 75 knots. And if you don't trim, you may find yourself a little bit slow on base after you add that second notch of flaps. And of course the aircraft's gonna balloon up a little bit. When you turn final, ideally you're going to start that turn in time so that you roll out almost exactly on the center line. Starting your turn early is much better than starting it late. If you start the turn too early, you can always stop the turn midway through the turn and then continue to fly straight and level until you get a little bit closer to the final center line and then turn the remaining small amount so that you roll out on the center line. But if you start late and don't finish your turn until after you've passed through the final, well, 
you could really get into trouble. And of course, in those situations, going around is often the best uh, choice. But let's talk about some of the reasons why you might end up overshooting the final besides just starting a turn too late. One of them is that your bank angle could be a little bit too shallow. I like making my turns in the pattern at a 30 degree bank, yet the other day I flew in a Cirrus with a pilot who said that his prior flight instructor said never, ever, ever bank more than 20 degrees when in the pattern. Well, I'm guessing that instructor either flew mostly pretty slow airplanes, uh, which by the way, when you're slow, your turn radius is much uh, smaller, or they flew really large patterns, which is what's going to happen if you only bank at 20 degree angle. Now, another possibility is that they were just afraid that they might stall the aircraft if they got all the way up to 30 degrees of bank. Well, I've got the chart here, and it basically shows that if you're banked at a 30 degree angle, your load factor is 1.15 Gs. Square root of that's going to be 1.07, which means your stall speed increases by 7%. That's not very much at all. Now, if you were to bank all the way to 45 degrees, well, that is a big deal because then your stall speed is going to go up almost 20%. So I get pretty annoyed when people have uh, 45 degree banks in the aircraft in the pattern. Try and limit it to 30 degrees, but boy, 20 degrees, it's going to be really slow to get you around in the turn. And where I see that to be really a problem is first in faster aircraft like the Cirrus because... The faster you are, the bigger the turn radius. And of course, if you're shallow in your bank, that's also going to increase the turn radius, which makes it really hard to roll out on the center line of the final without overshooting it. It's also a problem if you're doing a power off landing. Often I see people only doing 20 degree banks when they're doing a power off landing and they get these ridiculously slow turns, large turn radiuses, and they just never make it to the runway because they're flying a much longer arc, which takes them longer. And of course the aircraft descends and they lose all their altitude before they reach the runway. So just remember anytime you're doing a power out uh, turn, you really want to get turned around relatively rapidly and a 30 degree bank will help you do that. Now let's uh, go back to where we were, which was rolling out on final, assuming that you have rolled out on the center line. That's the point where I would put the flaps down to 30 degrees in the newer Cessna 172s. And the older ones, I often put them down to 40 degrees because you could really come down quite rapidly with 40 degrees of flaps. And then I would target an airspeed on final of about 65 knots. The POH says anywhere from 60 to 70. I figure if you're 65, you're right in the middle of that. So if you end up getting a little slow or a little fast, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Now let's talk about what to do if you end up high on final. First thing you want to do is use your power and your flaps first. So if you're high, go ahead and pull the power all the way back if necessary. And if you haven't already put all the flaps in, go ahead and put all the flaps in and then take a look and see, is that going to get you down to where you need to be? And if it doesn't, well, then you're going to have to slip the aircraft or go around. Now, I was flying with a student uh, just the last week or so. We were in a 172, and I asked him to slip. And he said, oh, no, my instructor, who I know to be a fairly high-time instructor, said, never, ever slip a Cessna 172. But to be fair, people have often told me their instructor told me something, and the instructor says, no, I didn't. So <laughs> I know that things aren't always relayed uh, properly. But if you go to the private pilot to ACS, which is the replacement for the PTS, you are required to do a forward slip on the check ride. So let's take a look and see what the uh, POHs actually say. If you look at the older POHs, those for uh, aircraft built before 1986, there is a placard and it says avoid slips with flaps extended. Now it doesn't say don't do them. And there is another section that says the fuel selector valve should be in the both position for takeoff, climb, landing, and maneuvers that involve prolonged slips or skids. Operation from either left or right tank is reserved for cruising flight. A better explanation for why you might not want to uh, slip aggressively is found in the 172S uh, POH, which is uh, for the latest model of Cessna 172. And it says, when landing in a strong crosswind, use the minimum flap setting required for the field length. If flap setting greater than 20 degrees are used in side slips with full rudder deflection, some elevator oscillation may be felt at normal approach speeds. However, this does not affect control of the airplane. So what they're saying essentially is that you might occasionally, when you do a slip, find that the yoke is going in and out a little bit 
all by itself. Now, I've got thousands and thousands of hours in 172s, and only once have I seen that to have been the case. Yep, there was a little bit of oscillation in and out of the, the yoke when we did uh, a slip, but have done tons and tons and tons of slip, never seen any kind of problem with that. And by the way, all of these uh, recommendations on slips only apply to the Cessna 172. There is no issue for the 182, the 206, or any of uh, those type aircraft. So I think people should consider using slips. And uh, in my experience has been quite good with them. Uh, and even if you do see a little bit of oscillation, it's kind of more of a curiosity as far as I can tell, rather uh, than any kind of uh, problem. Okay, so we were just talking about the forward slip, which is the technique for losing altitude. It is related to, but somewhat different from the side slip, which people use for crosswind uh, correction, which we're not going to talk about right now. Okay, so now that we've talked about different uh, tips for getting around the traffic pattern, let's talk about that audio I played at the very beginning of the show, which was in the traffic pattern at San Carlos Airport a couple of days ago. I was in the Cirrus, and you'll hear the references uh, made to the Cirrus. And uh, the other aircraft was a Cardinal, which started to cut us off in the pattern. And the reason was we had been extended. Actually, the uh, aircraft in front of us had been extended on downwind, and we were told to follow them. So we flew a longer than usual downwind. And the Cardinal was told to follow us, but they didn't see us. And so they went ahead and turned, even though they didn't see us. And of course, you can hear the controller uh, kind of lecturing the pilot about that. So just because you get to the point where you normally turn base doesn't mean that you should always turn base. And the controller basically says, you know, when I tell you to follow traffic, if you don't see that traffic, don't turn base. And I'm not sure that I've actually read that anywhere. It's just one of those things you kind of pick up from experience uh, when you fly in a busy traffic pattern. Okay, here's the uh, air traffic control audio, which I recorded through my headset. Cardinal 52132, follow the upwind Cirrus into right close traffic, runway 30, clear for takeoff. 30, clear for takeoff, follow Cirrus 52132. And then about 30 seconds go by, and the next transmission includes an instruction from the tower to the Cessna in front of us to extend his downwind, which set up this uh, problem that occurred. Skyhawk 1191, Mike, San Carlos Tower, Belmont, through departure, runway 30, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, 3091, Mike, we're rolling. Set the 6 on Mike, extend downwind for departure spacing. Extend downwind, 6 on Mike. And that's actually an example we talked about earlier, which is the controller might tell you to extend your downwind to create a little bit more space so that he can launch one or two aircraft that are waiting to depart. Cherokee 1034, the upwind Sky, uh, Skyhawk is a Belmont to departure, departing the airspace. Runway 30 cleared for takeoff, right close traffic approved. 30, clear for takeoff. Cherokee 034. Set the 6 for Mike, base leg approved, runway 30 clear for the options, traffic departing Cherokee. Leg approved, 30, 6 for Mike. So the controller just told the Cessna in front of us that he can now turn base. Remember, the Cessna was extended on his downwind, so he's turning base much farther out than normally an aircraft would turn base. And we're going to have to go even farther out on our downwind before we turn base, so our base turn is going to be even later than his was, simply because he's slow. He probably flies 65 knots on final. We're fast. We're going to fly about 80 knots on final. If we turn base the same place he does, we'll probably catch up with him and have to go around. So you can see the pattern is getting bigger and bigger. And now you'll hear us in the cockpit talking about spotting that aircraft in front of us and about how we're going to have to extend our downwind even further. And we're just going to hold our altitude. No point in starting a descent until we've gotten uh, perhaps turned on to final because we're a long ways away from the airport. Here is down really low. And we'll be going out farther than usual. I'll just leave the power up. I don't think we want to uh, descend right away. Like he took a really down long downwind, but that's right. The tower told him basically yeah. the tower extended him. That's why. Cirrus three Charlie Alpha follow Cessna, turning a mile and a half. Final heading to your right, number two runway three zero clear for the option. Number two three zero three Charlie Alpha. Okay, next you're going to hear me talking about how he's going to be really slow. And then I'm looking to see what my distance is from the airport, and I say that it's two miles. And I know that on a normal glide slope, you drop about 320 feet per nautical mile. So that tells me, hey, if I'm two miles out, I should be up about 640 feet at that point in time. He's going to be really slow, so we're going to have to... Yeah, good checks. We're going to have to give him uh, lots of room. We'll leave the power up. We're going to need all this altitude.
distance to the runway. Only two miles. He looks like he okay. is. You're probably good now. And about 20 seconds later, the Cardinal speaks up. He doesn't see us, so he wants to know if he can turn base. Good question to ask. Flash 132 doesn't have the Cirrus in sight. May I turn base? Cardinal 132, the Cirrus is 1 o'clock and 2 miles base leg to final. Flash 132, I'm looking. So the Cardinal does the right thing. He asks, he doesn't see us, and he says that he's looking. But then he gets impatient, and he turns. Cessna 1191 Mike, remain outside Bravo and uh, Bravo Airspace, contact North Carolina Approach, 125.35. 125.35 outside of Bravo, 901 Mike. Thank you. Do not start base stuck until you have the uh, Cirrus in sight. And you may have just barely heard me say he corrected. I've been watching the Cardinal. What I meant was he corrected by turning back to the downwind to uh, avoid us. Echo, Star Puppet 9287 Echo, 30 Echo, 30 Echo, you ready to go. 4987 Echo, San Carlos Tower Tax, you have to hold short runway 30. To hold short 3087 Echo. Cardinal 132, do you have the Cirrus now? A beam into your right? Uh, that's negative, I'm looking for. Cardinal 132, he's now behind you to your right. 132, we'll start our, start our base. Cardinal 132, affirmative. In the future, when I do give you traffic to follow and you don't see him, do not turn base leg because you were cutting him off. Sorry about that. Well, I hope you found these tips on traffic patterns helpful. Obviously, we don't have enough time to talk about everything there is to know about flying in the pattern, but I look forward to any feedback you have. Speaking of feedback, coming up next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the trip bringing back the 206 from Texas, and then we'll get to those listener questions about crosswind landings and about medical marijuana. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Before I talk about the trip from El Paso, a quick thank you to two people who left iTunes reviews. One from Australia, that's uh, Patrick, RV10, free to fly, who says lots of nice things. Thank you, Patrick. And this one came in a few hours ago after I already recorded the news section where I implored you to go ahead and contact your congressman for uh, privatization. And this comes from El Lazy Flyin. And he says, I want to thank you for your efforts in the podcast. I have emailed and contacted my senators in regard to ATC privatization and voting against it. I was going to do it anyway, but you drilled it into my head like any good CFI so that I couldn't forget what I needed to do. Mark, thanks so much for doing it. So like I said earlier, if you have not contacted your representatives in the House in particular, please do that today. All right, let's talk about the trip from El Paso. I originally was scheduled to bring back the 206 three weeks ago with the new owner. And I told him, you know, I think we really ought to postpone the trip because it was supposed to be 113 degrees in El Paso. We needed to stop in Scottsdale for a meeting he had planned. And uh, the temperatures there were supposed to be about 116. And, of course, it was forecast to be uh, about 120 in Phoenix that day as well. So the uh, POH for the Cessna 206 only has data up to 104. And, frankly, I don't like flying in what's hotter than that anyway. So we uh, just did the trip this past weekend where it was more than 10 degrees cooler. So it really made it much more pleasant. Now, the new owner did uh, what I have suggested to other folks in the past. He went down a day ahead of time. Uh, and that way he was able to take care of uh, all kinds of paperwork uh, before I arrived. Uh, for example, uh, even at the last minute, he found that the, some of the ADs, the airworthiness directives that had been done, had been not uh, signed off in the logbook. So he was still getting that done when I arrived uh, late on Friday. Fun thing, uh, I didn't realize that uh, NASA's Super Guppy is based in El Paso. So we got to see that. I took some pictures of it. And you know what? I think I'll post those on the Patreon page so you can uh, see what the Super Guppy looked like when we went by it. Anyway, we got to the airport bright and early on uh, Saturday morning. Uh, we had purchased uh, sandwiches the, the night before from uh, Subway, so we had our lunch with us, and we were all ready to go. We got to the airport about 6 a.m. Engine start was about 6.40 a.m., and we took off soon after that. Now, this 206 is equipped with flint tanks, and I think the owner said that gives them a total of 130 gallons. Uh, the flint tanks that I had on the Cessna 210 I owned years ago uh, gave us a total of 120. We purposely did not fill up those tanks, which made us about 30 gallons lighter, which made it a lot easier to climb out on a hot day. Uh, and so that was also the case uh, when we refueled in Scottsdale. We didn't uh, fill them up either. Now, on takeoff, uh, I had a discussion recently with uh, DPE who was telling me, gosh, the uh, big bore Continental engine like we have in the 206 was uh, you know, heating up. And so that DPE pulled the power back to try and help cool the engine. 
That is not the right thing to do. Uh, that's because with the Continentals, the 310 horsepower engines, to keep it cool, you really need to be full throttle to get the amount of fuel flow required to keep it cool. So if you're flying a big bore engine, don't pull the power back to try and uh, cool off the engine and the climb. About the only thing you can do is open cow flaps, lower the nose uh, so that you've got a, a higher climb airspeed, which forces more air through the cowling. Anyway, we had a pretty uneventful trip to Scottsdale couple hours to get there. Arrived about 8.30 a.m. where it was already in the low 90s. And when we left at 10 a.m., it was 98 degrees. So we were happy to uh, get moving on from there. Uh, climbing out of Scottsdale, we climbed to 8,500 feet. And early in the trip, we could tell by looking at the fuel range ring that Mammoth Lakes, which was our destination in California, high up in the, the mountains, was beyond the point where we would have reached our one hour of reserve fuel that we had set. So I pointed out to the owner that if we slowed up the aircraft now early in the trip, perhaps to maybe 60% power, I don't remember exactly, that we would burn less fuel and therefore we'd be able to make it to Mammoth without eating into our reserve. And in fact, we landed with about two hours of fuel. So we started with, uh, you know, basically we gained an hour of fuel uh, by slowing down on the trip. So I've got to do that early in the trip. If you do that late, it's not going to make much of a difference. We climbed to uh, 9,500 uh, feet before we reached uh, the Las Vegas area. Now, that's not the correct altitude for that direction of flight, but we didn't really want to climb up into the uh, oxygen altitudes. And when we uh, passed through the uh, Las Vegas area, approach asked us about that. And we said, no, we'd like to stay here just for uh, the thicker air. And they didn't have any problem with that. Now, we had a lot of uh, Southwest jets flying below us at about 8,000 feet as they were uh, going into the Las Vegas area. And after we passed by Las Vegas, just barely to the west of the Class Bravo, we switched back to center and we were told that we would have to climb to 3,000 feet if we wanted to maintain radio communications and flight following, which we did. That's a very remote part of the country. You'd like to be talking to somebody if something goes wrong. Uh, so we certainly didn't want to uh, stay at low altitude, have a problem, and not have anybody know immediately. So we climbed up to 14,500 feet and we strapped on the oxygen, which, by the way, we checked before we left El Paso. So we wanted to make sure uh, that we would know before we chose to fly over the mountains that indeed our oxygen was working. And the 206 has built-in oxygen. That is, the turbo version does. So that's pretty handy if you remember to bring along your oxygen mask, which we did. Now at 14.5, the temperature was 5 degrees C, which was a, just a delicious 41 degrees. So it was nice and cool after what had been a pretty hot day. Uh, as we were going into Mammoth, uh, we that's now that's a mountain airport that's pretty high but it's also pretty long we started encountering a lot of updrafts and downdrafts and so i was pointing out to the owner that we needed a lot of uh power management. So on final, we ended up sometimes being almost full power and sometimes almost zero power. And that's kind of what it took to maintain our airspeed as we went through these updrafts and downdrafts. Now, interestingly, this aircraft had just been equipped with an angle of attack indicator. And earlier when we were on the autopilot, uh, as we started to climb initially, what, to uh, 9,500 before we got to Las Vegas, we had full power on uh, and the aircraft was not climbing at all because of the downdraft that we were in. And we knew that early on because the angle of attack indicator started beeping at us. So anytime you get a downdraft and you've got the autopilot on, the aircraft is going to start to pitch up. And of course, as it pitches up toward uh, an angle that's anywhere close to stall, the angle of attack indicator would, would be warning us. Well, we got to Mammoth about uh, 1.50 p.m., ate our lunch that we'd brought with us. We left then about 2.40 p.m., and by then the winds had really kicked up. They were 2.60 at 14, gusting to 24, which is almost straight down the runaway, which is great. We climbed up to 16,500 feet uh, and then flew directly over Yosemite, got uh, photographs of Half Dome, and also all the snow that's uh, still up in the Sierra Mountains there. It's just a phenomenal amount of snow this year. And the next day on Sunday, right after we passed through the Yosemite area, uh, a large fire started there. That's called the Detweiler Fire. And last I read, they'd had uh, evacuations of 5,000 people. So that's a pretty big fire. They were happy that we missed that by one day. And the rest of the trip was uneventful, landed at Concord, California, put the aircraft in the hangar, and then I took an Uber back to my home about an hour away. So great trip. 
Let's take a look now at some listener feedback. This comes from Seth, and we answered Seth's question in the last episode, episode 20, about uh, Beechcraft. And you may recall that Seth was talking about becoming either a BPPP certified instructor or a Sierra CSIP certified instructor. And he said, in part, you are the man that was above and beyond anything I've experienced in answering a listener question. Listen to the podcast on the way home from work. It was great. I've been subscribed to Tom's newsletter for years now as well, and it's great to hear you interview him. And then he says some really nice things about uh, believing that uh, Tom and I are the top of his list for top civilian flight instructors. So that's very kind of you. Thank you, Seth. And also thanks for joining us as a Patreon sponsor uh, after we uh, read your uh, listener question. And this comes in from listener Charlie, who is referring to episode 19 when we talked about Air Canada. In that episode, I said that one of the most important things to learn from that was that anytime you as a passenger or as a pilot see something that just doesn't look right, you really need to speak up. Here's what Charlie has to say about that. Hi, Max. This is Charlie, and I wanted to comment what a great podcast series you're doing. Absolutely love them. I wanted to make a comment about the Air Canada incident and how important it is that all of us as pilots report things that we see. I was flying out of the San Carlos Airport a few years ago, number one for takeoff, and there was a twin coming in, at about 100 feet above the ground, and I noticed his landing gear wasn't down. He was just motoring along, and the tower didn't say anything. So I grabbed the mic and said, Twin on short final, your gear's not down. Well, instantly he did a go-around, and uh, after he completed the go-around, or after he started the go-around, he came back on and thanked me profusely. A couple of seconds later, the air traffic controller, the tower, cleared me for takeoff, and he also thanked me profusely. If I hadn't made that uh, observation on the microphone, quite a few people would have had their day ruined. So again, all of us, when we see something, let's make sure we, we let people know about it. Thanks again for a great show. And you're very welcome. Thank you for sending your listener feedback. Love hearing from our listeners. Let's talk about listener questions. This comes from Michael, who is one of our Patreon sponsors, and we were exchanging uh, comments through Patreon, and he said, I would love a discussion about flap usage on crosswind sometime. My CFI, who has about 800 hours but is young enough to be my son, suggests little to no flaps with less flap usage, the stronger the crosswind factor gets. By contrast, Rick Durden's books recommend regular flap usage for a more stabilized approach. He says, since I live in Iowa, I have a fair amount of crosswind experience, and given my tendencies to come in high and fast, I would honestly prefer greater flap usage and the more stabilized approach. Well, I always like to go to the uh, POH just to see what the, it says for starters. And for the 172S, the latest model, it says for 172, when landing in a strong crosswind, use the minimum flap setting required for the field length. Now, other aircraft, such as uh, Cirrus, uh, they tell you to use full flaps all the time. Uh, I have often heard people say that if you have a strong crosswind, go ahead and land at 20 degrees of flaps. And the rationale was not that it was going to help you with the landing, but that once you got the aircraft on the ground, the airplane would be a little bit more stable uh, and not get you know, tossed around by the winds when you're on the ground. Now, I haven't noticed any problem at all landing with full flaps ever. Even when I'm landing in the Cessna 172 at the maximum demonstrated crosswind velocity, which is 15 knots. But here in this area, we may have a 15 knot crosswind, but our surface winds rarely exceed you know 20 to 25 knots. Uh, in my experience, Experience has been 30 degrees of flaps, no problem in those conditions. Now, if you're flying with, you know, 30 knot surface winds or, you know, higher than that, yeah, maybe you will find that uh, landing with uh, flaps at something less than full flaps, which would be 40 degrees for the older Cessnas and 30 degrees for the, the newer ones uh, might help a little bit. But I agree with you. In general, I just go ahead and use full flaps. I really find that that's uh, yeah, helpful. But of course, I've got a very short runway here and I like to come in at uh, the slower speeds when possible. And our final listener question comes from a gentleman who sent me a long list of possible topics to use on the show. Thank you so much for that. At the very end, he said, and now a question that for obvious reasons, I don't want my name associated with on the air. How does medical or in some states, recreational marijuana use affect licensing? Yeah, I'm sure he means getting your pilot's license. He says, if someone has a legitimate medical use and a state issued card, would that invalidate their medical, either regular or third class? Personal opinion here, marijuana is less dangerous than alcohol or excess caffeine, let alone, uh, let alone tobacco. 
Obviously, flying intoxicated isn't acceptable. No matter the sources, eight hours from bottle to throttle would apply. Well, it's not going to affect you getting the pilot certificate, but it is going to affect getting a medical, which, of course, you need to solo and to take a check ride. And it was pretty easy to find uh, online. The FAA website has the Guide for Aviation Medical Examiners. That's AMEs. In part, it says... Uh, there is a section here uh, that says do not issue. So for all the things below that line, it said AMEs should not issue airman medical certificates to applicants who are using these classes of medications. And it says uh, controlled substances, schedule one to five, an open prescription for chronic or intermittent use of any drug or substance. This includes medical marijuana, even if legally allowed or prescribed under state law. And below that, it says, do not fly. Airmen should not fly while using any of the medications in the do not issue section above or while using any of the medications or classes, groups of medications listed below without an acceptable wait time after the last dose. All of these medications may cause uh, sedation, drowsiness, impaired cognitive functions. And it goes on to say, this impairment can occur even when the individual feels alert and is apparently functioning normally. In other words, the airman can be unaware of the impair. So pretty simple here, basically says if you're using marijuana, even if it's legal, they cannot issue you a medical. Well, that wraps it up for this show. Remember, if you haven't contacted your congressman in the House of Representatives, do it now. Let them know you oppose ATC privatization. And if you have a listener question you'd like answered, go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on listener question on the top of the page so you can record your question. And please help me knock off the first two Patreon goals to get to that $200 a month so that we can go ahead and order up the apps so people can find us in the app store. Just go to our Patreon page, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And if you're thinking of buying a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me early in the process so I can help you with that decision. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the country. If you love the show, check out the online courses I have available at pilotlearning.com. In the meantime, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. 